All right, chapter 19 is going to cover African societies from 1400 to 1800. And if you've not noticed just yet in your book, these chapters cover fair amounts of time. And that'll slow down a little bit as we get more current. But uh, 400 years seems like a lot of time to cover. So if, if you'll put that in context with the idea that this is um, a class that's more than just history, it's about cultural relevance, learning about these particular cultures and how they developed, uh, and putting that into a historical context. Maybe that makes a little bit more sense that it's such a large amount of time. Uh, but if you didn't take the first half of the class, uh, I'll tell you those chapters cover a lot more time than just 400 years. So if you'll kind of follow along with me in the book or in your notes in, in Moodle, if you are not Moodle well, in Learning House, if you've not noticed yet, there is a outline that might maybe you could print and make notes on. I don't know. I just have tried to exhaust my resources, uh, put them into your hands so that hopefully you will feel a little bit more comfortable in success in this class. When we start the, this particular chapter, it's talking about West Africa. Uh, and you'll see that Africa is split up pretty much East, West, North, South. And their cultures develop very differently. And uh, certainly historically, we see a lot of differences as well. Uh, the first thing I'll point out to you is the Senegambian societies. They have a social caste system, which isn't new to history. It's not different to history, but they have six levels. It's royalty, nobility, warrior, peasants, low-class artisans, such as blacksmiths, etc. And then their lowest level are slaves. Now these slaves are what your book called chattel and that's on page 559 and chattel is one of those bolded words. I point that out because this is truly the lowest form of humanity. Chattel is a possession. Um, my husband went to law school and chattel is a term that they use in law school as a thing when when a teacher is trying to present a scenario of uh, somebody traded this with this and and now it's their chattel uh, it that kind of to me really illustrates this term as far as it's the lowest possible form uh, and depending on who the owner of these particular slaves was was dependent upon who or how they were treated uh, we see in this particular area of the world a lot of age grade systems and they evolved. Uh, your book talks about this on page 559 as well. Uh, there is a neighboring kingdom ruled by an OBA, OBA, also a term very similar to a king. Uh, and it ended up evolving into a spiritual leader beyond just uh, a realm kingdom. Uh, they began to trade with the Dutch and the Portuguese, and of course that opens themselves up to a number of issues that we'll get to shortly. The next section talks about the Sudan and uh, the lives of the people that are in this particular area. There's a map there in your book on page 560. It talks a little bit about uh, the slave trade and how uh, the Africans that lived in this portion of the world were freely trading their own people. Uh, a lot of times they were captives from a particular war or battle that they are selling to the white man. Uh, and in my uh, classes, we sometimes talk about, you know, we as Americans often carry this guilt about uh, slave trade and that we still uh, had such a terrible role in all of that. But the truth is, that was a two-way street. These slaves were uh, sold to us by their own people. Do not hear me say that we are completely innocent, but there's more to the story than just one bad guy and one good guy. Uh, there's so much more here, and, and the book does a decent job of delving into that a little bit. Uh, a struggle for West African societies was often diseases. Uh, they did not have... Um, good ideas of medical care. They had a shaman or some other religious type figure that might come in and try and help them deal with that. But often they had very high infant mortality rates, 
short lifespans, which kept their families very uh, low in number. Uh, they had uh, mosquito-borne malaria, as well as smallpox and something called sleeping sick sickness, which was fly-borne and transmitted. Uh, their trade was... Um, often amongst themselves. And, and again, your book's got a map on page 565 that shows you the trade routes that go throughout the Sahara. And um, these trade routes are ancient and they're used primarily for trade, uh, moving goods from one place to the other, uh, making money for uh, a, a very few amount of people. But um, what we see happening here is they're also going to transmit ideas and cultures and often religion. Uh, this is truly the way that um, Islam moves very quickly through uh, Africa and then ultimately the world. Uh, but getting back to the text, it talks about the Chereg, um, and this is um, a term that you'll want to know for your test, as well as the cowry shell, uh, which was a form of payment that was used in trading uh, within the African markets. Uh, Faith-wise, uh, your book gets a little bit more into Eastern Africa and talks about Ethiopia, which is certainly a country that you're all familiar with. Uh, as I mentioned, the trade routes are a large part of that movement of their faith, but that's not the only faith there. Um, we see Africans being influenced by Europeans coming in and bringing Christianity. Uh, and then there were always uh, some that were already there. What we see, your book talks specifically about the Ethiopians and Coptic Christianity, which is still around today. Uh, from time to time, I hear it mentioned on the news about uh, Egypt. And um, they're the Coptic Christians struggling with uh, the Muslims primarily there in Egypt, which uh, I talk a lot in my seated classes about bucket list. And Egypt's on my bucket list, but until something dramatically changes uh, in their region, I don't know that it'll ever be safe for me to go. <laughs> uh, but Coptic Christianity is an Orthodox Christianity that began in Egypt about 451 AD, and it has thrived and survived for a very long time. Uh, it was um, adapted after, after Roman Catholics and the Jesuit missionaries came in, uh, and often they are uh, known for very, very similar uh, practices, vestments, etc., uh, but ultimately they just have their own flavor on it. Next, your book talks about the Swahili, and um, you'll want to know that term for your test. These are people that are located along the East African coast. They were often sailors, which meant they could trade with other communities uh, along the sea lines. And um, they were introduced and in many ways influenced by Indian, Indonesian, and Persian cultures. Um, the... Uh, the Swahili are still around today. We know uh, a little bit about them, uh, even just from the news. Now, I've mentioned slavery, and uh, the next portion of your book gets into that institution of slavery. And um, we see it really kind of begin with the Europeans needing or wanting slaves in Europe. Now, their need for slaves was minuscule in comparison to what uh, was needed in the New World. And, and I'm not just speaking about America. I'm speaking of uh, North and South America, uh, with uh, particularly with the explorers discovering gold and wanting someone to mine that out for them because often the natives of that particular area just were not physically able to do that. Uh, but we see many of them coming from South Africa uh, initially and then even East Africa. Uh, the populations are raided. Typically this was not a European thing. The Europeans would come over and basically come to port where uh, fellow Africans were bringing their people or conquered people uh, to the Europeans to purchase. Um, the transatlantic trade uh, was uh, 
there's several theories concerning this development. Uh, the cost of importing Chinese and Pacific people is too much. Africans had no problem selling their themselves uh, or fellow Africans to Europeans. Muslims, by this point, had even equated blackness with enslavement, which is certainly different than what we know of Muslims today. Uh, and Christians had made an association as well of black Africa and slavery. And so, really, culturally speaking, uh, we had at this point begun to accept what would uh, develop into this large slave trade. There are slave tra uh, trade routes called the Middle Passage, uh, where Europeans were trying to find the swiftest route across the ocean, bringing in these people. Uh, and then we often see shore trading where slaves are exchanged for goods. Uh, moving beyond that, uh, your book does a really good job of explaining what slave trade actually looks like. Uh, I wanted just to throw a couple of numbers out at you. Uh, slave imports, uh, as far as where people were going, uh, so many of us as Americans were so American-centric in our thinking, certainly in our history, uh, that we expect that most of the slaves came to us, and that's not true. Matter of fact, about 45% of the slaves traded went to Brazil, uh, which is really quite remarkable. Uh, the peak of slave trading uh, ran from about 1700 to 1800, and um, we see that about 10 to 15 percent of those that were traded ended up dying in transport. Uh, a really sad story. Uh, again, please keep in mind, I am just uh, trying to give you a quick overview verbally of the material. You do need to read it. Uh, hopefully this is just a supplement to you. And uh, if you've got some questions, let me know. Have a great day.